Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, well, I want to first welcome you to Princeton. I wish uh, the times are different such that we could actually welcome you to campus. It's actually quite a beautiful day outside here. Um, and I hope you're all doing well and you're safe and sound in the current situation and uh, you're feeling at least partially sane. So uh, we are very pleased uh, to be able to offer our annual summer school on condensed matter physics again this year. And uh, we're very pleased by the effort of the organizing committee here, which I'll introduce in a second, to be able to offer this program online. And we are very excited that uh, we have 250 registered uh, um, participants in this program and many, many more that are joining us uh, in our webinar format. Uh, just briefly, this is a summer school that has been going on for the past 15 years here at Princeton in condensed matter physics, and it's associated with Princeton Center for Complex Materials, uh, which is a NSF supporter uh, material research science and engineering center, which has been going on at Princeton for 25 years. Um, just briefly, our center uh, is focused on studying of uh, topological quantum matter, uh, polymer systems, and quantum information uh, related materials uh, for the past six years. And we are very pleased actually that we had just been uh, renewed for another six years to, uh, to proceed. And hopefully we'll bring you to summer school also in the future years and hopefully uh, here at Princeton. So uh, this year's program, which I'm very excited to participate in is uh, um, on magnetism in quantum materials. And a feature of our PCCM summer school is that it is organized and uh, run by our graduate students and postdocs. Uh, the faculty play a very minimal role uh, in, in the program. Uh, the students basically select the speakers and invite the speakers. And we are very grateful to the wonderful set of speakers that have accepted their invitation to join us. So before I go uh, further, let me just thank uh, those who have been involved in bringing this program to you. Uh, Galara Farahi, uh, uh, Zhao Yu Song, uh, Nick Cork, and Zhao Yu Ling. Uh, are the, the four organizers of this program. I, I want to really thank them for the effort and the agility they showed to bring this program quickly to you on an online format. And I want to also thank our staff, uh, Sam uh, Weissenkopf, uh, Sunu Arya, and Jennifer Bornkamp for giving them support in order to uh, bring this program to you uh, in an online format. So uh, I do have uh, one important announcement to make. Uh, uh, so as you many of you know, um, in the wake of the recent events in the US um, that highlights the shortcoming of our um, justice system and inequality and uh, representation in our society, uh, there has been effort by many to uh, show support uh, and uh, also take actions uh, to, uh, to highlight uh, these, uh, these shortcomings and to contribute to mending them. Um, some of you may have uh, learned, as we learned in the last uh, 24 hours, that there's been movement uh, uh, to support uh, these uh, uh, ideas and uh, call for action uh, by a, an, a strike on STEM F activities on Wednesday, June 10th. Uh, what the organizers and I decided that uh, it is very important uh, that we lend our support to these efforts. So you will hear from us shortly later today as how we have. Uh, reorganized or rescheduled the, the talks and the poster session this Wednesdays, Wednesday on June 10 uh, in, uh, in solidarity with the, uh, the strike on STEM to increase the number of uh, underrepresented group in uh, science and technology. Now PCCM has its wide effort itself for many years to contribute to this uh, uh, inequality. Uh, I won't dwell on them. You're welcome if you're interested to look at our webpage and all the different programs in outreach and uh, inclusion and diversity that we try to uh, put together over the last uh, 25 years. But let me just uh, close by again thank the organizers and uh, thank the speakers and the support staff to bringing this program uh, for you online. And I look forward to seeing you uh, here and also in the poster sessions uh, uh, throughout this week. Uh, again, you will hear from us shortly uh, on email about our activities, our rescheduling on Wednesday. So I'm very pleased uh, to, to first introduce our, uh, uh, our first uh, chair uh, woman, uh, Zhao Ming Sang, who will uh, take it from here. Okay, thanks Professor Yastani for the opening remarks. And welcome everyone to our 2020 Princeton Summer School. 
And before we get started, so um, let me introduce you how to, uh, for the Q&A session. At the end of each talk, we will have 15 minutes for the Q&A. And please type in your question in the Q&A bottom. That should be located right at the bottom of your Zoom window. We've disabled the chat function, so please type in your question in the Q&A. And now let's get started. And it's my great honor to introduce our first speaker and also my research advisor, Professor Leslie Shoup from the chemistry department of Princeton University. She's gonna talk about how to use chemistry logic to design new quantum materials. Leslie, it's all yours now. One second, let me get the slides on. Ah, there's screen sharing disabled, sadly. Ah, no, that's there, okay. Yay, one second. Um, yeah. Sorry. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, hi, I'm very pleased to um, kick off the summer school today. Um, which has a topic of magnetism and quantum materials. And um, as you all know, it's Princeton's condensed matter physics um, summer school. So just a brief comment is that now me giving the first talk, um, it is not going to be a full on physics talk. It's going to be um, a very much a heavy chemistry talk related to condensed matter physics. Um, because what I'm going to talk about is what can we learn from chemistry to make an impact in the field of condensed matter physics and um, with focus on quantum materials. And so you might have noticed, although the title of the summer school is a magnetism and quantum materials, um, my uh, talk does not uh, have the word magnetism in here, just the quantum materials um, by itself, which doesn't mean I won't talk about magnetism, I will. Just, I think um, the point I'm trying to make throughout this talk is that chemical logic and ideas kicks in before we think about magnetism and we can add magnetism as an ingredient as a second step later to our design materials. So let me start um, about that. So if we want to understand how chemistry can make an impact in the field of condensed matter physics and quantum materials, I think we, what we want to visualize is that there is this triangle of uh, property and structure relations um, that we're always trying to understand. And I think you might know that this lower half, how electronic structure relates to physical properties is something we often try to think about in, for example, the field of topological matters and some, some other quantum, um, uh, quantum materials fields. But when it comes to magnetism, this link is actually not that clear to us even within a condensed matter physics because if you have really, really strongly correlated materials that often, often appears in magnetism, there's no, it's very difficult to accurately describe electronic structure. But crystal structure and chemistry, which is on the top of this triangle is what actually connects both of these things together. So we can use the crystal structure to under, learn something or get some predictive power about the electronic structure, but we can also use the crystal structure to get some predictive power about physical properties. And so I put resistivity here, but this includes mag magnetism, any kind of physical properties. And so in order to understand us, what power we gain by understanding crystal structure, we first really need to go a step back and understand crystal structure and understand the field um, that actually studies crystal structure the most, which is solid state chemistry. So what is solid state chemistry about? So historically, this field was all about describing the structure of matter. And historically, it was not, not necessarily linked to properties. Um, but so what it did was trying to give us a, an understanding of when a certain system adopts a certain crystal structure. And having this knowledge is really powerful then to later connect this with properties. So let's look. So here's a typical plot. So this is actually, this is a very recent paper from myself. Sometimes I'm a pure solid state chemist and not necessarily think about physics with these materials. And so this is, um, these kind of plots are a very typical solid state chemistry thing to do, where you think about a certain system. So here was um, A, L, and P, two S, six phases, where L, uh, A is either um, sodium, potassium, rubidium, or cesium, and L, N is a lanthanide. And if you plot the ionic radii, 
or the sizes of these atoms on two axes, you will see that there's certain areas in this diagram with different structures, different crystal structures. And there's also an area where we don't form any of these phases. So making these kind of diagrams gives us some knowledge about what is structurally possible. But okay, so let's take a step back and think about why this is so important. So in this slide, I'm showing examples of five different crystal structures which all belong to phase, like ternary phases. These are all ternary materials. And they all have a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one composition of three different elements. However, I, here are five different structures I can adopt. And these are, by the way, not the only five. There are many more. I just plotted the most simply ones, simple ones. And you can see that there's a huge difference already just from the structure. So this structure is layered, this one is very three-dimensional, this is kind of layered. Um, we see different type of bonds drawn. So, so, why, so how can we learn or get an understanding of one each, each structure is, um, is formed? Because it, that means if I want to make up a new material or like get an idea that like, let's say, lithium gallium germanium is cool for something, so maybe sodium gallium germanium is also cool for something, doesn't necessarily mean it will have the same structure. And so we need to understand these three major things to have some kind of intuition, how people like to call it chemical intuition, about what structures are possible. And this is thinking about electron count, about the sizes of the elements in questions, and about the type of bonding between them. So there are different types of chemical bonds and we need to think about them. And so I want to go through all these three things step by step so that I hope at the end of the lecture, you have some idea about structural stability. So electron counting, um, I mean, there's a lot to it, but a very simple first approach would be to just write numbers over each row um, or each column of the periodic table, which is associated with a valence electron count of this material. And then if you have a compound and you want to know its electron count, you add up the numbers on the top, like sodium chloride, which is table salt, would get one electron for sodium, which is in this um, column, and seven for chlorine, which is here, then you would get eight electrons. And so with this rule, you can say whenever I hit whatever is needed on electrons to fill a valence shell, so it's eight up here, and then when the D electrons come in 18, then um, I have a charged balance system. And if I have a I, I learn two things when I have a charged balance system, no, three things. One thing is, if it's charged balance, there's a chance this is a semiconductor or an insulator. A lower chance is a metal, can still be a metal. We'll talk about this in a second, but there's a chance. If it's not, um, if it's not charged balance, there's a, there's a chance this is a magnet or a chance this is a metal, okay? Also, there's, there's this kind of unspoken rule that actually most things want to be closed shell, um, at least if they're composed of P elements in the P block here and S elements. It's different here in the D and in the F block, and we talk about this a little bit in, the se in a second. So we can, we can count these electrons. We have to watch out a little bit with stoichiometry that we always count it for the most electronegative elements. So electronegativity is right, goes up like this in the periodic table. Actually, let me turn this to laser pointer. Might be better. Um, it goes up like that. And so, um, so if you would count calcium fluoride, like shown here, we would also get eight electrons in charge balance. So let us think, what does, what does charge balance help us? Well, for example, we can think about um, semiconductors by just looking at electron counts. So you might know that gallium arsenide is a very famous semiconductor. And if I count the electrons, I get three plus five, which is eight, eight electrons. And then I can keep playing this game and go to ternary compounds. And if I count to eight, I will still get a semiconductor. Or if I include D elements from the D block, I count to 18, I will still get a semiconductor. So you see here, scandium platinum antimony, which is not intuitively a semiconductor, but because of the electron count, if you look at the calculated band structure, you see that it has a band gap as a semiconductor. Just pointing out that if you go down the periodic table to very heavy elements, like here with bismuth or mercury and tellurium, sometimes this band gap closes, but you still have something which is called a semi-metal, where you will have um, either touching point of bands or equal amounts of electron and hole pockets because you have this charge balance. Okay, great. So that sounds super simple. That sounds like everything you need to know about chemistry is how to count to eight or 18 and you're done. And I mean, that would be sweet. Um, and I love life would be so simple, but sadly it's not always that simple. 
Um, an example, you see, this comes from my time as a graduate student, um, where I was working in lab and a friend of mine, still close friend of mine told me, look, I made this turn your new face. It has lanthanoid gold antimony one to one to one, and it's a, it's a new compound. And I was like, no, no, you can't be right. Because I was working on one to one to one phases and I had learned that these always want to be charge balanced, very, very, not, not always, but very, very high likelihood, especially if they contain nictides and lanthanides on these things. So I was like, no, I mean, I'm, I can understand how you can make lanthanum gold tin, where tin has one electron less and we should have a semi-metal or semiconductor. But how can you make this of antimony? Where does this 19th extra electron go? It doesn't make any sense for me. But then we were looking at the crystal structure and once we solved it, and it helped us solving it, thinking about it, we'd realize what is happening in this material is that the gold atoms come to uh, very close contact to each other. So because they're in this close contact, they can form a chemical bond between these two gold atoms, which then takes one electron per gold and moves it down in energy. So think about it as a hydrogen model where you have two hydrogens with one electron each and they form a molecule. So therefore they're not open shell anymore, right? They don't have a single unpaired electrons that could make it magnetic or flow around. And so this is what's happening here. There's a bond formed be between gold atoms. And then if you input this crystal structure into a DFT code, you will see it also has like a pseudo gap and a semi-metallic in spite of the 19 electrons. And so this is a 19 electron is here is a formal electron count because in reality, you would have to count two formula um, units at, uh, per, per count. And um, then you can uh, boil it down back to um, the typical 18 electron count. Okay, so these, this is actually not that uncommon that something like this happens. So this is um, a class of materials called zintel phases. And um, the prototype, like a textbook example of zintel phases is calcium disilicide. So let's look at this material. So here's the crystal structure. If you would count electrons in calcium disilicide, you would count two per calcium, you got this, um, and then four per the silicon, and you got this twice, which makes 10 electrons in the total formula unit. And the more electronegative element here is silicon. So you divide it by two and you have five electrons per silicon. So five is not eight. And I just told you in P electron systems, it's very, very unlikely to have partially filled states. So how is this possible? So if you look at the, ele at the electronic uh, crystal structure here, you see that each silicon forms three bonds uh, to each other. So that means that um, similar like to a nitrogen atom, which where you, you might know the molecular ammonia, when nitrogen forms free bonds to hydrogen, this silicon also saturates, they saturate their uh, um, electrons by sharing electrons through bonds, just like molecules do. And so this is an example of a polyanion, um, which is very common in solid structures and how you can have a semiconductor while, um, while having um, a formally non-charged balanced electron system. And so it really gives us a lesson is that we have to look at the crystal structure to be able to count the electrons. We cannot just br blindly do it by putting out a formula sum. And so zintel phases, they, they have been established a long time ago and they differentiate between different things, which is polycations and polyanions. So depending if you have more than eight or 18 valence electrons or less, what kind of structure you form to kind of stabilize the electron count and still have a semiconducting system. And so there's a simple rule um, how you can check if, um, if your zintel phase is charged balanced. This is like this kind of a bond formula. It's very simple. It says that you have a bond order um, that you can calculate by subtracting your valence electron count of your X atom, which is whatever forms the polyanionic or polycation structure from eight or 18. So an example is at silicon. We said our valence electrons count per silicon was five. So if you subtract five from eight, you get a bond order of three, which means we want to have three bonds um, to have a charge balance system. So we do have three bonds of each silicon, so we're good. It's going to be a simple semiconductor. Okay. okay, so but then as I said, we need to think about the type of bonding. So we just established with um, zintel phases that chemical bonds actually really, really influence solids. And just thinking about it of hot spheres of something isn't necessarily um, uh, for fixing our um, or giving us enough intuition. And so chemical bonds, I mean, very, two extremely simple rules is 
One thing we can look at to try to understand them is the electronegativity difference. So if it's large, so here, this is how electronegativity increases in the periodic table. If you have a large electronegativity difference, you get an ionic bond where electrons are not shared, but just passed on to the next uh, uh, other more electronegative atoms. But if you have a small electronegativity difference or zero, like in calcium silicide, where silicon and silicon have no same electronegativity difference, then you can form covalent bonds, like in this example, or you can also form metallic bonds, um, which happens in intermetallic phases. Okay, so we need to keep this in mind. We get, can, we'll get back to the difference of chemical bonding and the nature of this to understand properties. Okay, so let's like, briefly talk about magnetism because now I talked about closed shell systems, how every like so systems like calcium cells, they're really got going out of their way to avoid having open shell systems. And so to avoid uh, exhibiting any magnetism because we can only have magnetism if you have unpaired spins. So we need to have open shell systems. And so this is extremely rare with um, compounds composed just of P block and S block elements. Doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of papers out of it which claim something like calcium nitride 1,1 1, 1, uh, would be magnetic. And I mean, think about it. So if you would put calcium, which is two electrons, and nitrogen, which is five electrons, you would get seven. So you have an open shell system. So if you plug this into a DFT code, you would get something magnetic. It doesn't mean that this phase exists or is stable. And so I'm just putting out a warning sign is if you live only in the main group elements, it's very unlikely you have an open shell system. However, we know we do have magnetism. And so if you are in the D block system, then you can have open shell systems. And so here it is important um, to differentiate between two types of open shell systems, localized ones where the spins are localized. And so then they can contribute to magnetism and delocalized ones they they're not necessarily uh, contribute to magnetisms, but rather to metallic um, conductivity. And so this is related to electronegativity difference that we just discussed that if you have, for example, um, chromium chloride, like a famous magnet now, you have a large electronegativity and um, we will more likely have magnetism. And so basically that you can get a rule with these elements up here, like oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, sulfide, nitrogen to some extent. Um, it's very likely with a 3D transition metal element to get magnetism with oxygen and fluorine, even with these more down below here. But if you um, have like chromium together with aluminum or some, maybe I'm actually not 100% sure to have a good example now, but there are some intermetallic phases that are not uh, magnet magnetic with these materials. So don't be disappointed if you make a new cobalt phase like cobalt aluminum and uh, you just have a non-magnetic metal. That's totally possible. Um, but what is actually even a bit nicer to uh, for magnetism for in at least the predictive power sense are these um, lanthanides because lanthanides have very, very, very narrow bands and therefore very, very, very localized spins. And they very, very, very often contribute to some kind of magnetism in the system. So let's look at lanthanides a little bit. So they do have, uh, they, they're commonly charged plus three, which means like a three plus oxidation state. So which is why here I always said we usually count them as three electrons. And this is because they have an electron configuration of S2, D1, Fn. Um, and so these S and D, D electrons are usually given away and contribute to the valence electrons, whereas this S, so we count them as three when we do electron counting. But these F electrons are usually, or very often, very localized below the Fermi level and don't contribute to the valence electrons. But then if the F shell is partially filled, it can contribute to magnetism. So if you look along this, this line of, of lanthanide materials, if we um, assume they're all three plus charged, then this is the um, amount of uh, the electron configuration plotted right here that they can adopt. And so it means that at the end, where we have F0 and F14, our F shells is full and empty, and we don't expect any magnetism from these elements. But everything in between here, we can expect that magnetism will arise. And so there are some exceptions to the rules. For example, that euterbium preferred a two plus char charge instead of three plus one. So if you have euterbium here, you will have F14 already. And so you, you won't necessarily get magnetism. Or cerium in some cases can be plus four and then it would be F0 
and would not contribute to magnetism. It can still be F1. So it's just, I'm just saying there's always exceptions to the rules, but what you can take away from this is that um, rare earths are actually a really nice um, way to introduce magnetism into the system. Later. Okay, so now I wanna start talking a bit about how we con can connect this knowledge um, about electron counting if you just had two properties. So we realized that if we can count electrons and we count to 8 or 18, or we um, have something which agrees with the Zinter concept, we kind of can get an idea which of these very rudimentary electronic structures, these are chemistry electronic structures I drew here, we have. So with 8 or 18 or Zinter, we, we think we're probably either in this region or this region, whereas if we have a different number, we're more likely to be metallic or maybe magnetic. And right now I'm ignoring magnetism. But then based on electronegativity difference, we can guess if you have a small or a large band gap, like sodium chloride, which is an insulator and has a gigantic band gap, has a larger electronegativity difference than gallium arsenide. And then also it plays in if you have heavy or light elements. Okay, so just based on these few electronegativity rules and electron counting rules, we can get some idea about properties. Okay, but this is not everything. So I already showed you a diagram in an introduction slide that the sizes of the atoms or the radii also matters. So I want to point this out again, is that this is another diagram here of X, Y, Z phases where X is magnesium, cal uh, magnesium, calcium, strontium, or barium, and Y, Z is a combination like copper, like of a coin metal and a nictite like copper, phosphide, or silver, bisphosphate, and the radius are plotted here. And so you could now think, oh, sweet, Calcium copper phosphide, which is this point, has this beautiful layered structure as indicated here and has a honeycomb layers. And I want to do something with honeycomb layers, but for some reason I want to find something different. And if I make it with magnesium, I get the same thing, but I don't. I get this very different network and structure. And, um, and so therefore it's just, if we want to derive a new material to work on and, and live with, we need to kind of be mindful of not messing so much with the electron, electronic radii. So it's not always just okay to just change along the periodic table of elements. And so I want to quantify these um, electron um, ele uh, um, ionic radii rules a little bit um, by talking about the Pauling rules, which are very, very old solid state chemistry rules that have been established to um, predict um, coordination polyhedra or therefore also structural features in very ionic phases. And so these rules are not perfect, but they're very simple and they can give you some um, idea about limitations um, of structures you can have. So the idea is extremely simple. It says like, okay, all solids are packed to fill space as much as possible. And so you think about these spheres, anions are always larger than cations. And based on this, you can make a geometric relation that if you have something in a tetrahedron or an octahedron, you will get different ratios of radii which are possible so that this atom literally fits into the polyhedron. And so Pauling derived this geometric constraint based on this and said, well, if a radius of a cation, K is cation, divided by the one of the anion, is larger than that number, they get a cubic coordination. If it's in between these, you get an octahedral combination. And if it's smaller than this, you get a tetrahedral coordination. So it's very simple rules and they don't always work because they ignore chemical bonds. Okay, so when we were just talking about how chemical bonds uh, can be important. So they only work for really purely ionic things. So you don't have to worry about directed bonding. Um, but they do give us some idea. And just so one idea where Pauling holes come, one example for when Pauling holes come in handy is for example, the prediction of this material bismuth dioxide. So um, in a paper in 2012, which by the way, was a very, very good ground bathing papers, which I don't have any issues with at all. I really actually, it's one of my favorite papers because what the authors predicted in this paper is that at billion zone boundaries, um, like X points, you can have enforced band touchings in certain symmetries, and this can be used to derive a topological semi-metal. And so the example they took was, look, here's silicon dioxide, and it has these kind of symmetries that do that. And here at the X point, I see this degeneracy, but it's like 4.5 EV below the Fermi level. And I mean, we shouldn't be surprised because silicon dioxide is literally what our beaches are made of, it's sand, and we know it's a very good insulator. But um, then the author said, well, if I shove in, instead of silicon, I put a bismuth in this position. And so with this, they're adding an electron. Here's our periodic table, silicon is here, bismuth is there. 
So they're adding electron with this, they get rid of the problem that the, this is below the Fermi level. So it moves up in, in the Fermi level. And uh, you get the Fermi level at this crossing point. And uh, in addition, they actually move down the periodic table a lot to add spin orbit coupling and to lift this kind of uh, bands, which are very close to each other right here, away from each other. And so, so they, there are lots of issues with this material prediction, sadly. So one is that I said unfilled sh shells and P systems, I said this several times, are usually not stable. And this is also a problem here, but I'm actually not going to focusing on, on going to focus on this problem. I'm just going to give you an example of why you cannot just put a gigantic cation like bismuth, which is a lot larger, into a space which was filled by a tiny cation like silicon. So let's um, look at the ionic radii. So you can go to this website here, very beautiful, and they're all tabulated. All the Shannon ionic radii and crystal radius are, uh, are uh, tab tabulated. And so you can look up the radius of your anion oxygen, it's 1.4. And then let's, we can do a sanity check and see if silicon dioxide fulfills the falling rules and should be in a tetrahedron, like it's shown here. So you look up silicon, has a four plus charge, right? It's silicon dioxide because each oxygen is two minus. And with a four fold coordination, the ionic radius tabulated here is 0.26. And so if you divide 0.26 by 1.4, you get 1.41, which fits in this, uh, uh, requirements from Pauling rules. So Pauling rules predict this should be a tetrahedron. But let's do it with bismuth. So if we look at bismuth, the first problem we run into is that it can, doesn't exist in charge plus four, and that's actually related to p electrons uh, problems that I mentioned before. Uh, but let's not worry about this right now. So let's look if we find it in fourfold coordination. So we re realize, oops, it's another problem. It's not even tabulated to exist in a fourfold coordination. But okay, so to be fair, let's just pick the smallest number listed. So this is all the measured radii for bismuth that have been measured in the different materials. And if you take the smallest one out there, 0.76 and divided by 1.4, you get 0.53, which is way too large to fit in a tetrahedra. So it tells us it's just not possible to shove a bismuth cation into an oxygen tet tetrahedra for simple size considerations. Okay, so this is all the rules I wanna teach for today about structure. Um, so now I wanna talk a bit more about how, we, how do we connect this to properties. And so this is, has been also very established in solid state chemistry that we do connect a structure to properties by looking for similar structural motif and making a connection. So an example is that, um, Iron-based superconductors all have the structural motif of this um, edge-sharing iron arsenide tetrahedras or iron selenide tetrahedras, and um, these are all superconductors. So that's great. So once we understand that, we can use our knowledge about structural stability, but this is why it's so important that we know to make more materials with these structural motifs. But right, we need to watch out just that lithium iron, because lithium iron arsenide has this structure, doesn't mean that sodium iron arsenide has the same structure. So we need to do more thinking than just replacing elements. And then uh, we can do the same thing with other structural motifs where we found something interesting. So frustrated magnets, which I think might come up in, in the schools, also are often related to a structural motif. So I think um, when Joe Tchaikovsky will give his lectures later, he's probably going to talk about Kagome lattices, which is again a structural motif. So once we understand when, when can this motif exist, in a crystal, we can come up with more interesting materials that have this motif and therefore the property associated with this motif. Okay, and so this is when we go back to the triangle, which I should have had a slide again here, where we had the crystal structure at the top and then and then properties and, and electronic structure. So this makes a link between structure and property. But what I became interesting is was more make the link between structure and electronic structure and then to property. So I want to talk a bit about structure to electronic structure. Uh, links for now. So I already said that this is very, very rudimentary uh, prediction we can do based on electron counts. And this is, uh, I call this more chemistry like band structures where we uh, do not plot uh, the momentum dependent of the band structure. But you know, in condensed matter physics, we rightfully have more information in a band structure, which includes momentum. And that's where we often hit a language barrier between chemistry and physics where um, this band structure is not necessarily that intuitively to um, be understood by chemists. Um, 
because chemists have much more visual idea of, of thinking about um, materials by, by looking at orbitals and drawing pictures of these. But the beautiful thing is that there was this one person, Roald Hoffman, who actually laid out um, a, a method for chemists to intuitively understand our electronic structure. And so I want to introduce this a little bit before I'm connected out to crystal structure, um, just because so that we are on the same language page here. And so I was lucky enough to meet, meet Roald in, in November 2018, which is a picture here. Um, which is always interesting, very exciting if you meet somebody whose work had such an impact of how you become as so who you are as a scientist. So Roald has a set of papers, I'm citing one here, um, which lie out for chemists how to understand electronic structures in, in case space. And so basically it says, well, in chemistry, we call it the LCIO, linear combination of atomic orbitals approach, which is basically a, a different word for saying a tight binding model. And so with uh, periodic boundary conditions in a crystal, we get this equation. And if we just plug in k equals zero in this e equation, we will get, um, at, uh, if we just look at a 1D chain of hydrogen atoms, so as a very simplest example of a solid, we will get this equation, which means all our S orbitals from the hydrogens have the same face. So we draw them in the same kind of color with the chemistry pictorial way to look at it as. And then if we go to the other extreme of K as pi over A, we will get alternating. Um, so this is the coefficients of the, um, of the S orbitals. So we get alternating um, phases of the orbitals. And so we draw them in alternating colors. And so we know that this set here has the maximal potential to have a bonding overlap and everything that is bonding is low in energy. So we draw it low in energy and we know this one is the maximum potential to be anti-bonding. So we draw it high in energy. And based on this, we can sketch a very simple band structure of a 1D chain of hydrogen atoms. But it becomes better than this because we can have more intuition because now if you say, well, 1D chain of hydrogen atoms, how nice, but this is nothing realistic. Whoever made this, we cannot make it. And hydrogen, we all know, is a diatomic molecule. So I want to understand how does the band structure look if I put two hydrogens on a unit cell, which more resembles a diatomic molecule. And so I can do that also because I know from chemists who learn how to draw MO diagrams, if I do that, at, at the gamma point, I both have a fully bonding um, a molecular orbital and a fully anti-bonding one, which I put here. And then I just have to alternate these two blocks of things. So then at the uh, pi over a point, pi over a prime, if you call this pi, um, a prime, we get alternating sets um, of two pairs of uh, orbitals. And um, in this um, situation, when the bond distances are all the same, the point here is degenerate. And so what we then also intuitively understand next is if we were to form a chemical bond between these two hydrogen atoms, which is, resembles a pyrus distortion, which is, resembles also chemical bond formation, then we change the distances. And because of that, we change the degeneracy of these two points. And we can intuitively understand why hydrogen becomes insulating. Um, and so this is just a very powerful method of understanding band structures and chemical bonds in solids in with a chemical logic without ever having to write down a tight binding Hamiltonian. And so this becomes really important for quantum materials if you think about what that means for graphene. So you know graphene is uh, this really beautiful high mobility topological semi-metal ideal compound with a beautiful Dirac cone at the Fermi level or six of them. And so how can we understand this as, as chemists? Because if you tell me as a chemist, what is graphene? I tell you, oof, it's carbon, and it has sp2 hybridized bonds, has three of them, and then it has like one an electron left in the PZ orbital. So if I were to sketch out a chemistry band structure, I would intuitively say, okay, I have these sp2 orbitals filled, and then I have the PZ orbitals half filled, and I sketch this out to block bands, and I get some kind of half field band. And then I don't want to worry about the symmetry or structure yet, if I just sketch this out into a case-based band structure, and this is why this is here in quotation marks, just very roughly, it's not, not accurate at all right now, I would somehow sketch a half field PZ band. So it means at this level, my chemical intuition tells me graphene is metallic, so I get that correct. 
but it does not tell me that it has the rock cones and a certain topological semi-metal and everything. But if I then look at the crystal structure and see that in fact they did make a mistake by just sketching it out because it has two atoms per unit cell, and I remember what Roald Hoffman told me about what I have to do with two atoms per unit cell, I was like, okay, yeah, I have to fold the band structure. So let's fold the band structure. So right, the lower part is always the bonding part and the higher part is the anti-bonding part. So I have a pi and a pi star branch of my band. And so I can extend the band structure into the next Brillion zone and I get a beautiful sketch of a band structure where a pi and a pi star band invert, which very much resembles qualitatively how graphene's band structure looks like. So of course it's very rough approximation, but that's uh, what's sort of, um, what we want to achieve. We want to gain some intuition. And so I was like, oh, wow, I understand why graphene has a Dirac cone very intuitively. And I understand, um, therefore, there's a topological semi-metal. But, but in this moment, the, what hit me was, well, this, was, this state in the middle, this folded state, was kind of a thought experiment in the middle on the world Hoffman's model from the 1D Piles distortion. Because the next step was formation, formation of chemical bonds and open up a bank gap. So why does this last step not happen in graphene? And so the reason is that in graphene, the electrons are delocalized through the whole sheet. So we often like to draw it as these like electrons in these rings. It's not fully accurate because they're not just floating around this one ring. They're floating around the whole graphene sheet, fully delocalized. And so if I were to localize these electrons in double bonds, for example, which would be analogous to the uh, pyrus distortion in hydrogen, I would open up a trivial band gap and everything becomes uninteresting. Or if I were to do anything else to mess with this delocalization of electrons, so like for example, putting in elements with different electronegativities, just like a boron nitride, um, then I would, I'm getting a massive band gap, right? Boron nitride is a really large band gap insulator. Or if I buckle these and form a fourth bond, something, anything to kill this delocalization, I get a band gap. So um, what does this mean? So it means that I want to have electron delocalization to resemble a band structure um, that can have a single Dirac cone out um, at the Fermi level. So I was thinking about this and there was a moment where I thought, okay, but that means we are screwed because this carbon biased electron delocalization is something which is very, very, very inherently special to carbon. And so there's a reason why organic chemistry is one of the biggest fields in the discipline of chemistry. And there's a reason why chemical industry and pharmaceutical industry and everything is massively based on carbon is because carbon does a lot of interesting chemistry and humans are based on carbon. So it's a, it's a very chemical versatile element which can bond, likes to bond to itself and do like a lot of crazy chemistry, including having these fully delocalized bonds. And it's just no other element is known to do that. And so there was a reason why early predictions of graphene like silicene, germany and stannine never really happened to be made, um, as, as, um, especially freestanding, um, because the same chemistry which is done by carbon is just not done by any other element. Okay, so hmm, crap. So did everything I learned now just resulted in nothing? Well, I didn't want to give up so fast. So let's just go back to what you learn about chemical bonding. If you ever took a chemistry class, maybe 101 or something, you might have learned, okay, there are these t different types of chemical bonding. So they're strongly ionic, which we already discussed when electronegativity difference is high. In this case, you usually get an insulator. You can also have strongly covalent bonds like in molecules or in silicon or diamond, where you also get a trivial band gap. And so thinking about strongly ion uh, covalent bonds and that they mean actually then resulted in an idea because these bonds, they're often referred to as two electron two center bonds, which I put as two E to C here, which means this chemical bond has two electrons con connecting these two atoms. Um, and, um, but they do not delocalize like in graphene over the whole system. But in graphene, I have a different types of chemical bond which does not resemble a two electron two center bond. Okay, only these, these sigma bonds like these car, um, sp2 bonds, they are typical two electron two center bonds, but not the pi bond here. And that reminded me that then later at some advanced inorganic class, you might learn about two electron three center bonds and two electron four center bonds, which do exist. So there must be a different way to describe chemical bonding where, um, where it's not fully localized, but you, you get a degree of delocalization. 
And um, so the, there are examples for this in molecules which are called hypo or hypervalent. Um, an example here is boron hydride. So boron is in a periodic table where it gets free electrons. So it can only form free bonds to hydrogens. And then you have, so each bond counts as two electrons, so you have six. So all the electron counting I told you right now it says I want to go to eight, so six electrons is not enough. But two boron hydride molecules cannot form a bond here because they're lacking the electrons to this to get like a happy eight electron molecule. So what they do instead is they form this bond bridged over hydrogen, as shown here, uh, which is called a banana bond. And it's called a banana bond because this is a two electron free center bond. So these two electrons uh, delocalize over these three atoms. And so you have some degree of electron localization in these molecules. So it's not like in a solid that you can draw a band structure from it, but there is another way to get electron delocalization, not based on carbon. And so you can have this with too few electrons or you can have that with too, with too many electrons. So here's an um, example of a hypervalent molecule phosphorus pentafluoride, where um, you have five bonds to the phosphorus. And so if you count two electrons per bond again, this is 10 electrons around the phosphorus, also not eight. So it's not, it's, it's something is not right. And so one way to describe phosphorus pentafluoride in the bonding is to say you have a four electron free center bonds along this extra line, where four electrons distribute um, among these um, free centers which again gives some degree of electron delocalization and then reduces the count formally to eight. Okay, so but in the molecule, these bonds don't help us at all because we wanna have it in a whole solid to be able to draw a band structure. A molecule doesn't have a band structure. So do the question I was wondering is like, do hypervalent bonds or hypovalent bonds exist in solids? And actually the answer was yes, hypervalent bonds at least have been described in solid. And this was again by Roald Hoffman in 2000. And there he, does, he has a paper where he says, well, there are some materials which have linear chains of antimony with seven electrons per atoms um, or square nets with six electrons per atoms of antimony. And these violate the zintl concept, the zintl, or sometimes called zintl clamps. So it doesn't match with the bonding order and everything we discussed earlier. So, um, they, and then he concludes that they're hypervalent. So, but why are they hypervalent? So let's look at the square nets. So antimony has usually formally five electrons. An antimony nine minus network, it will have six electrons. So if I have six electrons, this is my valence electron con uh, concentration with the Zinter formula, I would subtract six from eight, and it means I would expect it to form two bonds with each other to be a happy Zinter compounds. And so for example, sulfur, which also has six electrons, is known to does that elemental sulfur forms like these exact chains. I um, want uh, confirmation of it. But in antimony, so we have six electrons. And in addition, we have four bonds. So that kind of would add up to 10 electrons if you would count them as two electron two center bonds, the same electron count as in the phosphorus pentafluoride. And that's the only the why the only reason we can stabilize this is not by like having it have more than eight electrons in the shell, but by delocalizing these electrons over this whole sheet. And so basically what you no, learn from this is when you have a square net, a fully square net with this electron count, six electrons per net, net atoms, it must be hypervalent or it needs to distort into forming zigzag chains. And this would be a pious distortion to have this preferred confirmation. Okay, so we are again at the bridge of pious distortion as we discussed in graphene or hydrogen chain is that here, this band structure has too many electrons. If I want, were, were to localize these electrons into these bonds, then I would get a, a, a semiconductor. But these square nets exist in solids. So an example is zirconium silicon sulfide, which has such a square net, and it has six electrons per silicon. So we can count the electrons as I did up there. And um, then I get a silicon two minus. So silicon has four electrons plus two, gets me to six. So it's again, just like sulfur. So there must be a hypervalent bond in the square net for it to be stable. And so if you calculate the electronic band structure of this material, you get this beautiful band crossings. And um, I, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but for a really, really long time, this was the 
topological semi-metal with the largest um, bent inversion in uh, like energy of bent inversion like this goes from minus two to two EV here in some areas with the exception of graphene. So you get a beautiful band structure. It's a bit different from graphene because it crosses more often and it, that's why it's called a nodal line semi-metal and that's related to the symmetry of having a square net rather than a honeycomb. But um, this band structure does not only exist in DFT, it has been proven with Arcus and transport and all the other uh, um, methods many times. So I want to understand the square net a little bit better. And so how does the square net result in this beautiful band structure and, and in also this hypervalent bond? Because if I now go back and I do Roald Hoffman's analysis of drawing orbitals in the square net, I can do that. I get a band structure as is shown here. You could also just write down your tight binding Hamiltonian of the square net and use some chemical intuition for the hopping parameters. And then you get a band structure like that. But this doesn't have these linear bands. So that was a bit confusing. It's like, ha, huh? so I understand my hypervalent bond argument, but now that I don't understand the square net band structure. Not until you look that this band, uh, crystal structure actually in the hypervalently bonded square net also has two atoms per unit cell because the unit cell is defined by other atoms. And because it has two atoms per unit cell, this band structure needs to fold. And then it gets these beautiful crossings here. Okay, so this gives us the, the lesson we learned from this is we need two things. We need electron delocalization and we need two chemically equivalent atoms per unit cell. And then we can have linear band crossings that are at the Fermi level. Um, so here's a, a bit better tight binding model if you include some next nearest neighbor hopping and only look at Px and Py orbitals at the center square net. And this is just a, a comparison to DFT and you see that there's a remarkable agreement. Okay, but I just wanted to point out that we need both, like two atoms per unit cell folds the band structure and we get the crossings. But it doesn't pin our Fermi level at the right position. So we could have many, there are many materials in these crystal structures with side-centered square nets where the Fermi level is just up here. And so we can use electron counting, like PBFCL as an example, and if you would count it, you would count to eight. Um, and we don't get, um, we don't get the, uh, the Fermi level at the right position. What the hypervalent bond does for us, the delocalization is that it pins the Fermi level here at the interesting position, okay? This is why the chemical bonding becomes interesting and important. And so now what, what can we do with this once we learned it? So there, there are many of these phases that crystallize in this crystal structure and also other crystal structures which ex exhibit these side-centered square nets. And here you see the um, elements which can each uh, sit at each position in different colors. And you see that there's a large variety of phases you can make. And you see, here's all the fun part. You can include all this magnetism, potential for magnetism into the systems also. But the question is, when do I have a hypervalent band and when do I have this band structure and this uh, thing? And that's something I was discussing with my postdoc Sebastian Clemens. And we were thinking, well, we could try to count the electrons in the square net but that's not that easy. So the electron counting I t introduced to you at the beginning was like ele counting a total electrons in the system. And you can always count the total amount of valence electrons, obviously. But here I need to know if the square net has a certain amount of electron count, like six per square net. And for that, I need to know the oxidation states of these uh, atoms because I need to know if the blue atom gives electrons to the square net, so it takes electrons from the square net, um, or what the red atom does. And that is not always as straightforward as you would think because often oxidation states are very hand wavy and it's, it's really, it's not an exact science. So we were thinking electron counting is probably not the best idea to fully understand it. So let's go to the second toolbox we have at solid state chemistry, which is, was related to sizes. But now I don't wanna look at um, ionic radii sizes. I wanna look at bond distances, which is also some kind of measure of size of atoms. And so the hypothesis is, if this is actually really a delocalized chemical bond here in the system that drives this interesting electronic structure, then um, I will have um, a shorter distance between the atoms in this net than to the next atom above and below. So why is this? So a chemical bond always reduces bond distances, right? Because it pulls, it bonds the atoms closer together and pulls them together. So I can just define that this uh, distance is supposed to be smaller than this distance, uh, than the distance to the next atom, oh, the, this distance, sorry, than this distance to the next atom above or below. And so for this one crystal structure, I could form, put this in an equation 
So this is a simple equation. So the d square net, this distance is supposed to be smaller than the other distance. And I could also put that in, in terms of lattice uh, constants and Wicker uh, coordinates, but that only works for each crystal structure individually. And then this should be smaller than one, or later we found maybe a better cut of parameters 0 0.05. And then I should have an hypervalent bond. And then ergo, because of that, I should have linear cross bands and a topological semi metal. So let's see how that works. So here's a plot where we plot the square net distance here, and we plot the distance to the next nearest neighbor atoms on this axis. So the way we plot it, this tolerance factor of one is this diagonal, and it becomes smaller, so more favorable to, fa to feature hypervalent bonds towards this direction of the phase diagram, toward the yellow area, and it becomes more, uh, less favorable for hypervalent bonds in this direction. And so the colors of these uh, points now represent electron for electrons count that we could kind of count, or it was obvious, whereas the gray ones are materials where we weren't sure. And you see the, the gray ones coming out everywhere. But the thing we, we notice immediately is the yellow and the orange ones are the charged balanced boring eight electron count things. And they're all here in this blue area. So there's no necessity for hypervalent bonds because these are already happy charged balanced materials. And then everything where the electron count is a little bit off is here in this area. And even more interesting, all the known topological semi-metals in this class of materials fall in this area. And then even unspecified materials like uranium ditelluride um, fall in this area. And this material now has been studied extensively as a um, as a potential to be a correlated topological uh, material. So that means that unlike band structure calculation, where correlations give us a problem, these chemical distance rules seem to be immune to the problem of correlations. So that was great. But so when we just looked at this structure type, which is isostructural to the conium silicon sulfide, we did not find any new kind of interesting materials to study in this area. But so that's the beauty about solid state chemistry. So we used this kind of as a calibration system and we found that we can understand square nets very well and can link them to electronic structure and physical property systems. So now we can move on to all these other phases which have square nets. So I just want to give you one example of these types of phases of square net. And we can make the same plot. And now the colors mean something different. We don't mean electron count. So now we compared our results with results which are published on this database here. You might know about this, which lists all the band structure and topological properties of uh, materials listed in ICSD. And based on this band structure plotted, we found this motif, this band structure motif resembling the square net type binding model and all these green points, which exclusively follow in the yellow area. And the gray points up uh, materials which are just not listed in this database. And then, we find materials which have band gaps in the data bias exclusively in the blue area. And then we find um, some things which are ambiguous. So the blue points, for example, they're materials which are listed as metals in the database, but then if you type the, in this material formula, like barium, manganese, fluorine, antimony, in, um, into, the, uh, into Google, with, together with band gap, you will find experimental evidence that these materials actually do have band gap. So this kind of points to a limitation of DFT, but this method, again, is not vulnerable to. Um, and then this orange point here is a material where based on electron count, we would say this is um, either topological semi-metal or uh, a band gap material. We're not really sure, um, but it's listed as a semi-metal in the, in the database. And then there are these gray data points, all these additional materials we can now categorize as material with these uh, methods. And so we, we picked out one of them, lanthanum zinc 0.52 uh, antimony, to understand if our method actually makes sense and predicts these uh, band structure motives correctly. And so look, there's a good reason this material is not in a database because it's off stoichiometric and DFT becomes just much more um, complicated to run. And if you want to establish a database of um, 20,000 or 100,000 materials. I don't actually know how many they did, but it's a massive amount of time. You need to cut your limit, uh, massive amount of materials. You need to make your cut somewhere. And it's a very sensible cut to not look at off stoichiometric materials. However, that gave us the chance to check if we accurately predict this with the method to be um, a topological semi metal. And so we did this in collaboration with Tom Seicher from UC Santa Barbara, who um, 
So this is a unit cell of this material where you see the zinc is only half occupied. That's why it has half of a white and half of a gray sphere here. And so to order to accurately model it, you have to construct a supercell. So you construct two different ones. And I will show you the band structure of only one of these supercells. And then actually, because the supercell is so large, and we, right when we expand our, our crystal structure, we fold our band structure. We had all this thing, two atoms per unit cell folders. This forced it like crazy. What he did is he, he folded it back into the original brilliance of this. So we can compare it with materials that look like that. And so that's the band structure you get. So you see all the smearing bands here, which is due to disorder, but you clearly see stable, nice linear bands, which are very similar to this typical granite motif in this material still. So that gives us a pretty high confidence value that we can use this tolerance factors or distance rules to um, accurately describe these granite materials. So now we have this rule. And we haven't talked about magnetism at all in these materials, but now we can add magnetism, right? So I told you the easiest way is to look at rare earth materials because there's very likely they order magnetically. So we can just go to our diagrams that I showed you before and pick up the materials where there's a mag magnetic ion and just look if they follow this motif. So one example is cerium antimony telluride, which exists in the structure, has um, actually quite complex magnetism, antiferromagnetism, ferromagnetism, and linear bands can be seen in ARPIS. And even here, we can use different um, symmetry changes um, which are induced by the magnetism to um, understand how the band structure changes um, as a result of the magnetism. A bit more interesting system, I think, where that magnetism goes bananas, and I'll talk about magnetism next slide, the system my postdoc Shiming Lei studied, which is based on gadolinium antimony telluride, where he found that actually this really wants to be astechiometric, so it wants to put more tellurium and less antimony in this crystal structure, which means it changes the electrons account, right? We're at the ideal electron counts here of six plus granite, so we're changing it, we move in, um, along this phase diagram. And then that means the, crust, uh, the structure starts distorting, so the hypervalent bond kind of gets messed with. However, it doesn't necessarily right away goes, go to a structure which only has zigzag chains, it also has these structures with more complex motifs in between, where there's still, uh, this is, is still a hypervalent uh, bond along this direction here. And what's interesting is what happens with these materials is that the magnetism really, really, really goes crazy. And we are like way away from understanding, understanding the full picture here. But um, so this is just one of the compounds of stoichiometric, and this is ma uh, magnetic phase diagram field versus temperatures along the C direction, A direction, and B direction. And so we have a multitude of magnetic phases, very, very rich physics to study here in the future. So, so the point I wanted to make this whole story is that once you define the chemical rule, and you have a, a find a material systems, so you can add certain flavors to it to make it more interesting or the physics more rich, such as adding complex magnetism to it. So I finally, what's the time actually? Well, so in my final minutes, I just want to talk a bit about magnetism in 2D and a very different chemical approach um, of how um, we can make an impact as there as chemists. So you might know that this was a big thing a few years ago started to become that we've got ferromagnets in two dimension or other complex magnetic 2D materials. And so most of these materials or 2D materials we currently studied are exfoliated from scotch tape. So we put a bit of tape onto a piece of graphite or a piece of another Van der Waals layer compound and we get a monolayer. This is all, all a complete other different field which kind of ex ex um, exists next to that, where you use chemical exfoliation to uh, delaminate materials. And so you can either start from a big bulk crystal and circulate it first and then delaminate it, or you can start from an intercalated crystal. So one of the ex um, advantages of chemical exfoliation is that it accesses more to materials. So you can, you can exfoliate a material that looks like this. If you would stick a piece of scotch tape to this material, nothing would happen. But with chemistry, you can make a new 2D material. So you, you just um, enlarged your material space a lot by this method. 
Another advantage for some material, not all of them, sometimes chemical exfoliation actually gets you a better and nicer sheets. So, I mean, there are some materials like graphite, you can exfoliate beautifully with sc scotch tape. I'm not that sure how much you can do with chemical exfoliation. But here's, for example, an, an example of ruthenium trichloride, which is a very interesting magnet quantum magnetic material or magnetic quantum material. I think Tuan Ong will talk about this later in the school. And so if you apply scotch tape to this, it's very difficult to get uniform large sheets. Um, I mean, of course, probably it's not impossible, but there are so far very few papers, if not any, on monolayer, no, monolayer ruthenium trichloride. But if you use chemical exfoliation, you can get suspensions with very uniform and actually pretty decently sized sheets. You see the sky by here, it's like nearly 20 microns across. Um, and, uh, and you have sus um, suspensions which are just filled up monolayers of this material. So, so what we were hoping to do is, is like, let's say we have a magnetic 2D material. So either Van der Waals material or an already intercalated material. Can we use chemical exfoliation to make a new 2D magnet? And so the material class we were interested in looking at was transition metal dicarcogenides, where you see a periodic table here of these elements which form layered dicarcogenides. And you might know a fam famous example is MOS2, which has this layer structure where you can put scotch tape on top and you get, um, you get a, a monolayer. However, we said that this are the material, these are the transition metals here of interest for magnetism in these things. And these don't seem to really form layered transition metal like a carginite. So for example, if you look at manganese, what it does with sulfide, it makes a cubic pyrite and good luck putting scotch tape onto this crystal structure and getting it to the layer. So what we found interesting was that chromium, this um, material here, forms a structure like that, where you can use chemical exfoliation to delaminate it. And so, so it reminds you of this crystal structure of an oxide where um, exfoliation, chemical exfoliation has been done successfully. The question is just, can we treat the oxide and a carcogenide with the same chemistry and get the same results, or is there, is there a different or that? So that's my uh, student Xiao Yu's work, who you all met earlier today. And um, so basically what she was going to try is like, can I uh, mix this uh, material with, um, in, with a dilute acid and some solvent and exchange the sodiums with hydrogen atoms here, which is uh, very commonly done in oxides and then use a large organic base and some acid-base chemistry as our advantage to delaminate the system. And so she tried that. This is how it looked first. So she grew a beautiful crystal of this material. She put it in acid. The crystal is still intact. It just doesn't look as nice anymore, but it's fine. We take it to the EDX to measure the chemical composition, and she found all the sodium is gone. Great. That's what we wanted. She puts it on an X-ray diffractometer, and if she shines the X-rays through this crystal, she gets nice crystalline diffraction spots. But if she puts the, shines the X-ray through the side, side of this crystal, she gets these streaks. That's not good. That means there's not that great crystallinity between the layers anymore. And so because of this, we couldn't solve the crystal structure with the X-ray. So what we did instead to understand this material was we took it to the transition electron microscope, where you can directly look at it. So here you see the sample in a lower magnification resolution or lower resolution um, image. And you see it's actually very nicely layered material. And then you can zoom in and you can look at the individual atoms. And so here you see bright spots and faint spots. And because heavier elements appear brighter in the TEM, you know that this one is chromium and these faint spots are sulfur. So if you say, okay, we, we started with the structure and we took out the sodium, if you look at top of this, we wouldn't expect different spots for sodium and sulfur because they fall on top of each other. So what must have happened is that the stacking changed and we see um, something like that, where uh, sodium is um, arranged by the six sulfurs exactly as you see here. Um, and that would have been awesome. So we look at this, we're like, great, we made, this is the structure of one TMOS2 and we are like, hey, great, we made one TMOS2 uh, based out of chromium disulfide, how cool. But yeah, the story is not always that simple. And Xiaoyu was very careful and she found this paper, which really saved us, where people put in sodium chromium disulfide in a battery and they electrochemically pulled out the sodium. And what they found is once they take out some sodium, the chromium migrates into the sodium space. So instead of making 
beautiful, nice layered chromium disulfide, what they did make was a three-dimensional bonded solid. So that would suck if we did that because the whole thing was we want to try to exfoliate this thing. So um, we took this crystal to the TM and now we cut into it so that we can look at the side view from the crystal of the TM. And what we found is that thank God this material is still very layered if you look into this. But if you zoom in, you find you have alternating bright crystalline strikes and faint amorphous stuff. And so what happens is if you zoom into this crystalline spot, you see the chromium does migrate to the interlayer spot as we sus uh, were suspecting. And we form this three dimensional structure, which is not a 2D structure anymore, but we do this only in a confined space. So you see this layers here are very thin, only about two Armstrong, and then there's amorphous stuff between it. So it only, it seems to preferentially migrate into two directions and then amorphize the other structures in between. So we were interested about the magnetic properties of this new layered material and if, it, um, if there's still magnetism in the system. And good news it is, this is the original compound, the sodium chromium disulfide is an anti-ferromagnet and the proton exchange material still has a magnetic ordering peak, but also um, actually a pretty large negative vice temperature, which indicates some magnetic frustration in the system. But the, the million dollar question was not the magnetism, was can we exfoliate this layered material? And the answer is yes, we can. So we just follow through with the original idea and put it in an organic base. And we can delaminate this materials into monolayers and the thickness agrees with the thickness we observed in the TEM of the crystalline layers. And so we confirmed that the layers we actually got are crystalline by putting it in the TEM and looking at these spots. Um, so what we ended up doing was not what we hoped originally was, what we ended up doing was we uh, made a material like that, amorphous crystalline heterostructure, and then exfoliated into an on sheet suspension that looked like this. Just want to point out, this is not the only type of uh, chemical exfoliation, what we do, and it's not always that complicated. We also made uh, magnetic 2D layers of other materials like iron oxychloride, and this has some preliminary data on vanadium oxychloride and some um, honeycomb manganese oxides that uh, might be exfoliatable. Um, so just to give you some perspectives is what can we do now that we have a nanosheet suspension of materials. So this is how it looks if you do chemical exfoliation, you get a suspension and the sheets are floating in there. So one thing that we realized that seems we seem to be able to get uh, to construct these materials into bilayers which form more ray patterns and we kind of want to understand more about the advantages we can have of chemical exfoliation to more ray physics. Another thing is that we're currently trying to clean these uh, monolayers into uh, cleaner sheets that then can be maybe fabricated into the devices and physics can be studied. But these materials are not only of interest for physical properties, they're also chemical properties such as catalysis or battery um, incorporation into batteries so these materials can be useful. And with this, I'm at the end. I want to thank my group and everybody's work who I um, introduced here especially and all my long list of amazing collaborators with whom um, I would not be able to do all this work and my funding sources and as well as you for your attention. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions now. Okay, thanks Leslie for, oh, okay. thanks, Leslie, for your talk. And now we're opening for the questions. So we understand that sometimes there might be a back and forth between the speakers and our attendees. So if you want to talk to our speakers directly, you can type in your question in the Q&A window first and then click on raise hand so that we will unmute you for a while and then you can talk with our speaker directly, okay? And now for the first question. So how do you define the stability of the phase? Does it based on the total energy comparison, the, form the formation energy or phonon dispersion? Leslie. Ah, well, it's a good question. So if you were to calculate this, then you have to do a lot of work, right? So you need to do all of these things. Phonons by itself don't do it necessarily. You need to check total energy and you need to compare it with competing binary. Like if let's say you look at the ternary phase, you need to look at competing binary phases and you got to find the global minimum. And I recommend the work of Alex Zunger in, in Boulder to look at this from a theoretical perspective. From a chemical perspective, it's just that based on these rules we have that for example, um, 
ionic radio ratios need to fit or that uh, certain materials don't want to be open shell, we can get some predictive power before we actually start calculating anything. Right? And so all these rules I discussed was kind of a way of how we get around running all these calculations, which makes it very complex. Okay, thanks. And for the next question, can the size of the polyhedra affect the physical properties? Oh, uh, the size, yeah, it definitely can. I mean, not only the size, but also the, the type of polyhedra because you have a completely different structure. So for example, in some of these structure diagrams I show, showed, let me see if I can get back to that. Uh, hello, Ugh. I don't know how to do this. So in some of these, some materials are metals, others are semiconductors, although they have the same electron count. Um, let me find one of these. Mm. Ah, here. So, for example, calcium. Um, here, these materials in the half. This is a half Heusler structure. They are commonly semiconductors, and all of them those have eighteen electrons. But then the materials in this structure they're commonly metals. So, it definitely affects your properties. Okay. And for the next question. What, what are the other atomic arrangements favoring hypervalent bounds, except for the square net? Can triangular lattice be one for certain atoms? That's a very, very good question. And I'm actually can't give you the answer, but I want to find this out myself. So <laughs> um, you need to uh, make similar de de derive, uh, you need to derive it similarly than um, what Hoffman did for the square net. And so it's easy to do this for um, honeycombs actually. Um, however, I found that in systems like for example, I showed here, these have honeycomb networks, but they usually want to, don't want to have hypervalent bonds. They just, although this net exists, they have the eight valence electron filled. So it's not a, it's not a simple to ask, answer question. Okay, thanks. And for the next question, so, um, I have a general question. Are the chemical logic just a post-interpretation of the first principles? Can we use chemi chemical logic to design quantum properties of materials without first principles guidance or when the first principles fail at the strong correlation cases? Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. So we need to derive the chemical logic. We need to formulate it out much better than it is right now. And that's like the main thing that we're trying to do in our group. But the the hope is that i mean i'm not sure if you always well maybe in a long time you can avoid first principles then but at the beginning you kind of want to see if you get the same results as point uh, point uh, first principles or if you even get better results when it comes to um correlated materials but yeah the hope is that at some point chemical logic can supersede first principle calculation yeah. okay thank you and for the next question it seems these three tricks considers more classical Coulomb interaction than quantum effects like exchange or correlation effects. I'm not sure what the question. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely true. So it's it's also all based on classical models. It's why it works so well for topological non-interacting topological phases. But there are also tricks to understand correlated materials. And I've not gone into depth onto this in this talk, but I scratched onto this with like we we intuitively know when the material is open phase. So we intuitively know when the material should be a mod insulator um, rather than like a metallic non-interacting system, right? So there's a reason that when um, some bismuth compound was predicted to be a non-somorphic eight-fold degenerate material that people like Bob Carver came out and said like, no, you have a mod insulator because these chemical rules also apply to, to, predict, um, to predict interacting phases. Okay, thank you. And for the next question from... Uh, anomalous attendee. How does chemistry understand the appearance, the H states in topological materials without using the Hamiltonian solution for a confined system? The H states? Yeah. 
I'm not sure what what they're referring to. How does the can you repeat the question? So um, it's how the chemistry understands the appearance of H states in topological materials without using Hamiltonian solution for its confined system. It should mean maybe at states or surface states or something. So I mean that that doesn't. I mean, yeah. So um, I mean, so what we can predict with chemical logic based on the system I introduce is whether or not we're going to have a band inversion. And then of course we rely to all the nice physical rules that realize, that said what can happen once you have a band inversion. And if you get out band inversion to spin orbit couplings based on how many you have, what does this mean for your bulk boundary conditions and your physical properties? Like, I mean, chemical logic will never, uh, never supersede um, these kind of pre uh, theoretical predictions. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, so what, what types of bounds can be formed in charge ordered material like in uh, barium bismuth oxide 3 and is bismuth disproportional into 4a and a uh, 4 minus a and 4 plus a but now in 3 plus and 5 plus state. Barium bismuth oxide is a famous system where chemical logic is also um, uh, important where bismuth formally would be um, 4 plus which it is not. So you say that uh, bismuth is disproportionate in three plus and five plus. But actually then later work came, it, it, it isn't fully correct because what happens is that bismuth is actually always three plus and the holes, the extra charge are sitting on the oxygen and the oxygens are forming molecular bond units, like little clusters around the bismuth to stabilize the structure. So I would need like five slides to explain the system. It's a beautiful system to understand with chemical logic, but it's complex. Okay, thank you. And for the next question. So how the chemistry understands appearance? Oh, wait, okay, so this question, okay, this question is already answered, it was. Okay, and for the next question. Is it possible to predict possible mold insulator materials from chemical logic? Yes, definitely. I mean, um, if you have, um, an open shell system with three D electrons, which is pretty ionic, and you know the electrons will be localized, then this will be a magnetic insulator very likely. If um, the bonds are not very um, ionic, then these unfilled electrons could be delocalized. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, you mentioned that honeycomb networks do not always lead to hypervalence states. Why? Is the problem that they demerize? No, no. I mean, the problem is that they just, so the square net Demorize. systems, demerize, the square net systems also don't necessarily have hypervalence states, right? So that's the whole point of, of this diagram here, where all these states have square nets, but not hypervalent bonds, just fully filled materials. And so with honeycomb systems, I didn't do a full search like that, but based on what I went for the database, they all fall like in this area and have an like zero or eight electron count. So they don't need to form hypervalent bond to stabilize themselves. So this, the hypervalent bond is something, this is what the material does if it doesn't have um, already a happy system to, which would be a zintl or eight electron system. Okay, thank you. And from the previous like attendees again. So, but what about the demoralization view of the surface surface states? Is not an alternative way to understand the surface states? Yeah. So, uh, of course, when you create um, a, a surface, you do a great violence to uh, the chemical bonds uh, within the structure, and then you, uh, this often in three dimensional solids reads, leads to surface reconstructions, right? For especially in the three-dimensional semiconductors where the charge balance is necessary to have, not so much in three-dimensional metals. And uh, this is a, a full of way and understanding. So there's actually a beautiful paper. It's also from Roald Hoffman. It's called Small but Strong Lessons from Nanoscience um, or something like this. It's like 2013 paper um, where he talks about um, cutting through, like creating nanostructures, which is basically all, also creating surfaces and understanding reconstructions based on the chemical logic. I can highly recommend that. 
Okay, thank you. And for the next question, how does the order of hyperion valency two electron three center to two electron four center in square net compounds affect the Fermi energy? The order from this? So, so. Uh, the order of hyperion valency two electron three center to two electron four centers. Um, is so it. In square nets, we always have kind of a four electron free cent. No, we don't actually have a center bond. So you, you cannot classify this in square nets because um, so, the, so this is called a four electron a free center bond here uh, because it's delocalized over only three centers. But in the square net, this is delocalized over everything. So this is like a electron in infinity center, infinity center bond. And um, there's, it doesn't, so the energy, what was the second part of the question? Uh, the second is, how does the order of hypervalency in square nets compound affect the Fermi energy? So the Fermi energy, so the, 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 this hypervalent bond, what it does is that it stabilizes the electron count of six electrons per net atom. So if you look at this band structure, so now this is a folded band structure, so you need to count double. That means that because it has six electron per atoms, so 12 here, we fill the S band twice. So this is two electrons or four, if it's doubled. We fill the PZ, which is be below, is another two. And then the PX and the PY, they degenerate, so we fill only half of it. So if it's six electrons, we pin the Fermi level at this energy. And with eight electrons, we would be up here. So the, what the hypervalent bond does, it stabilizes the six electrons, which usually would not be stable. You always would want it to go to eight and gives us the, the chance to put the Fermi level at the crossing point. Okay, thank you. And for the next questions, about chemical logic superseding first principle calculations, interpretation of accurate first principle bands of graphene away from the direct point or for any types of nanowires. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Okay, continue, sorry. Okay, and including spin orbital coupling effects requires to use simple PZ orbital and two empty these orbitals. How would chemical logic include that? Chemical logic is not accurate. So it will never completely get rid of this principles calculation because if you want to calculate the excitation energy or anything like that, this is not gonna be given by chemical logic. Chemical logic will just tell you a general principle of if a material can have a certain band structure and a certain property. It's not gonna give you any details about um, yeah, I don't know if you want to calculate optical excitation. So if you want to calculate phonons, so electron phonon coupling, all of these things, not not there. Okay, thank you. And for the oh, time, so we have two minutes left for the questions. And now uh, for the next questions. Um, so one attendee still don't understand the notion of an gold gold dimer forming an effective cation ion with lower electron count. So will the number of the electrons in the system is still the same? Right. So the total number, yes. But so you have to make a difference between electrons and valence electrons, right? So when we count, when we count these um, electrons, so see how I jump here from 11 to two, because once the D shell is filled, it usually just doesn't contribute to the valence electrons more. So you just ignore it. It's kind of, it's, it's coarse states, not really, but below the Fermi level. And the same happens here. So the moment it forms these bonds, because if you form, if you think about a hydrogen molecule and you form a bonding in an antibonding MO orbital, right, you have the energy states like here, and then one goes down and one goes up. So what happens in the bond formation is that the energy of these two electrons just move down so far in energy that they're not part of the valence electrons anymore. So you don't need to count them into the valence electrons. But of course, yeah, the total number of electrons don't change, doesn't change. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, so can chemical logic help us understand why generic fermion system obeys Luttinger's theorem? I have no idea because I don't know what that means. Sorry, but it's out of my head. Okay, and for the last question, sorry, like we only have one minute, one minute left. Um, can, can by the way, I, 
Okay. Sorry, one, one note to this. I'm happy to learn what this is and then think about this if somebody wants to talk to me in person. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for, okay, so we will take the last two questions. And for the, the question, like, can chemistry logic be used to predict whether a material will be a fer ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic? Yeah, there is some uh, rules for that, but uh, I mean, it's not, it's, as I say, this is it's a bit hand wavy, but based on the distances, so there's, um, you can look this up, it's called the Bettis later curve, it's an empirical curve, which looks at distances of atoms and therefore can uh, can tell you that manganese is an anti-ferromagnet, uh, elemental manganese, whereas elemental iron is a, a ferromagnet and also kind of predicts accurately what happens in a phase transition from, from alpha to gamma iron with the magnetism. Um, so the, there are some rules there. Then there are also some rules about super exchange, which are called the good enough Kanamori rules, which give you some predictive power if exchange is going to be ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic. So there are there are ways, but um, yeah, it's not always super obvious, of course. Thank you. And for the last question that we're taking, would you expect an important difference in polycations or poly ions forming the topological states? Well, I do want a hypervalent bond, so I don't want to actually have polycations or polyanions like in simple phases here, because then I have a, a reason to get rid of my delocalization, right? So these are all true electron center bonds where it's localized. I don't want these bonds. So I think based on the square nets, what we know is that the square net can actually accept or donate electrons in these phases. But actually I would look up again if it has, I think it has a tendency to be a polyanion actually when it's topological and hypervalent because it was antimony minus, silicon minus, like these are very common uh, to exist in a phase. So I probably, if it gives away electrons, it might not want to engage in hypervalence bonds. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Leslie. And thank you all for attending this morning's. Uh, lecture. So we're sorry that due to the limit of time, there are still some questions left that we don't have time to answer. And we encourage you to send an email to Leslie, to Professor Shuf directly to discuss if you have any questions. And our next seminar will start at 1 p.m. this afternoon. And looking forward to see you all this afternoon. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.